Welcome, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Joining us back on the program today is award-winning science fiction writer Mark Kingston Levin, who's going to be joining us. We're going to be talking briefly about his new book, 30th Century Escape. This is a story that will be exploring time travel by a secret society headed by Captain Jennifer Hero to implant a virus that would disrupt the genetic tendency towards sociopathy among the Sindos, which is a genetically altered group of humans. Our guest joining us, just to give you a little bit of background, is someone who's actually been deep when it comes into the fields of chemistry, where he graduated from the University of Vermont with a Bachelor's of Science. He was also employed by Boeing on Project Apollo and later worked on the Mars Project as well. He also decided to return to school to study under Nobel laureate Paul Dirac in quantum mechanics at the University of Miami, Coral Gables, obtaining his Ph.D. in just two and a half years. He joins us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today. I'd like to welcome Mr. Mark Kingston Levin. Thank you for joining us again, Mark. Well, thank you for having me. You bet. Now, this is pretty exciting because in your novels, what you really tie into is actual science that's being explored that might actually already exist, but it's certainly right there in the realms. That's pretty exciting stuff. Well, that's why I write it. I I really love science, and I love to uh, try to get other people to see some of the fun that I get from science. You know, one thing I've always uh, wondered about when it comes to science, especially when you look at science fiction, whether it's movies or whether you read about it in magazines, uh, things like that, is how the government always seems to get involved, and then they feel they're the masters of the universe about how this is dispersed, used, or even, you know, even tell us about it. Like, for instance, UFOs. Let's say these things really do exist. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, just to kind of put it right there. But they decide, well, we're going to hide this away and it's not for public consumption. You know, who decides this? What makes them think that they're at that level that, you know, that they'll decide when that should happen? Well, that's a, that's a mystery to me as well as to uh, many uh, other scientists. Um, and there's not always uh, uh, agreement among um, uh, scientists on how much the public should know. So, I mean, we had, uh, you know, a nuclear bomb project, and nobody knew anything until Hiroshima. And it always seems they come up with these scientific discoveries and say, well, how can we first militarize this and then turn it into a weapon? <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's <laughs> that's a lot of it. Yeah, that's what that's Because I think if time travel app actually existed, uh, I'm sure today people would be thinking, well, how do we teleport Donald Trump back in time? <laughs> yeah. Back to birth and maybe put him out on an island somewhere. Who knows? Now, let's talk about the book uh, 30th Century Escape. Uh, first of all, let's talk about uh, one of the main characters, Jennifer, here, who goes to the University of Hawaii to study physics and archaeology. Uh, let's talk about who she is and what she uh, introduces here in the book. Well, she grew up in uh, Canada, uh, French Canada. She's French. And uh, she um, immigrated to uh, Australia when she was 14. So that's, that's some of her background. And um, uh, she's a brilliant scientist who already has several PhDs in the 30th century. But when she comes back to uh, uh, 2015, um, she feels the best way for her to adapt is to go back to the university and study and get a PhD in physics. Uh, And and, uh, she gets a couple of other PhDs along her way, one in uh, archaeology and one in uh, nautical engineering. But, oh, I'm sorry. yeah, her, her first PhD was in history. I didn't tell you about that in the 30th century. So she's somewhat of a historian, and she goes back and studies the 2015. She doesn't, in, in the, the whole 21st century period, and she doesn't know why she's so interested in it, but she has almost an obsession to this period of time. And she wants to study um, so that she can understand her uh, lover, uh, they never got married, but uh, they were together 18 years. Then he was assassinated. And uh, she was uh, 
elected to the head of the secret society, and she had to manage the completion of the time machine without him. And she did manage, but she managed because she gave, she delegated to the scientists who knew what they were doing, and they followed uh, Zexton's plan. His, his name was Zexton Ho. And uh, so this is kind of the background. And in that period of uh, 2700, humans were exploring outer space. And I'm talking about uh, nearby solar systems they had sent robots to and had returned, and they decided that humans couldn't go because of the amount of radiation they measured in the round trip, that they had to develop a modified species, and they called those Sindos. And they were an improvement, and they could uh, handle this radiation. Um, the one way they could do it is that there's, it turns out there's a bacteria that contains a certain gene, and this bacteria handles a lot of radiation, and it repairs its own DNA. So they were able to take that and upgrade the human uh, and many other features uh, that uh, Sindos have that humans don't. Uh, they are stronger and uh, uh, able to withstand greater temperature variations because various planets that they plan to settle, they're actually going to settle them on these planets, and they didn't plan for them to be on Earth. But what happened is they did go out, and many of them settled other planets. However, there were some left on Earth, and they multiplied. But not only that, humans in their, uh, wanted their kids to be upgraded, so the mothers would say, oh, I want my uh, next child to be engineered uh, as a Sindo. And so by the 30th century, Sindos dominated the political system because they were the majority. And uh, they um, planned to eradicate humans. And Jennifer's organization found out about that and planned to go back in time and correct their DNA. Uh, and um, if they fix the DNA with this virus called D7, the symptoms will be more like humans in a sociological manner, and uh, their more moral compass will have been repaired, and it will not hurt them in any, any other way. So this is uh, the plan, and that she goes back, uh, her team goes back to the 27th century where the Sindos uh, were children, and they intend to uh, infect them with the virus. But currently, they can't infect them because shortly after the Sindos uh, were um, brought up, they in, improved their uh, DNA, uh, their immune system, and their DNA, and uh, they, they, the virus is killed by the current symptom. But if they go back to when they're children, it will pass on through the children in the, uh, the uh, uh, so sociopathic uh, tendencies will be lost. So Jennifer, that's Jennifer, and she is, I would say, uh, somewhat burned out. She has really been under intense pressure for a long time, and she spent, she was for many years an undercover agent when she was um, younger, and uh, she became a leader only in the last five years. So she is now off into the 21st century, and... Uh, is somewhat at a loss of how to uh, adapt because things aren't like they were in the history books that she read. So, you know, uh, uh, first let's uh, kind of chunk down a little bit on the Sindos because you're talking about a an improved human being who has uh, a new DNA strand, if I'm to understand this correctly. Well, who has the modified, modified, modified yeah, DNA. okay, improved DNA. anyway. Yeah, uh, and and the main thing I wanted to touch on was the idea of cellular regeneration. Okay, and that's yes. what you were talking about there, mm -hmm. uh, because we're in a day and an age now, especially with three D printing. I mean, now you can go into malls and you can literally see these machines three printing, making stuff. 
And, uh, we're, you know, I remember, I think it was just five years ago, I remember just as I was doing a show where we were talking about 3D printing, is that up in space they were already 3D printing the tools they would need to do repairs on the ship they were on in space. And that was the beauty of 3D printing. <laughs> you didn't have to take up a toolbox, for instance. But that being said, of course, now that we're taking a look at the biochemical idea of the Sundas, for instance, where would you say we are when it comes to 3D printing and regeneration when it comes to human tissue and organs, for instance? Yes. Um, well, from the point of view of organs, I think there's, there's research going on right now here in San Diego on Nancy Ridge Drive. There's a company that um, is uh, planning to do that. They're planning to make organs like kidneys and other things. And um, it's a startup company, started up maybe oh, five years ago or more. Uh, six, six, maybe six years ago, and um, they are, you know, going to print livers, print these, all these various organs. Uh, so that's their plan. That's their business plan. Uh, how far they've gotten, uh, I'm not privy to, but uh, I know they're not the only company working on it. There's other companies. There's companies in Germany and other countries, even Israel, uh, and uh, some, some uh, Japan. Uh, uh, have uh, companies that are working on this. Some are in government, mostly government laboratories, uh, like in the uh, UK and uh, Sweden. But uh, in uh, some, it's companies, startup companies funded by venture capitalists. So they must think there's a potential breakthrough there, uh, and um, there's because there's a fair, fair amount of money going in. I, I can't tell you how much, but I know it's over. I know this company started up with an injection of over ten million dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's not small money, but you know maybe not the hundreds of millions that if uh, if you expect you know if you get somebody like Google or Alphabet uh, to uh, to fund them once they do proof of concept, uh, you know you would expect hundreds of millions that go into this kind of uh, endeavor. But, uh, it's, yeah, it's certainly quite a project there. When you think way back uh, in the day, I'm trying to remember, I believe it was the uh, novel Coma. <laughs> and you kind of get concerned, uh, for those who may not be familiar, this is where they were actually causing so-called accidental deaths during surgery. <laughs> and usually these were real easy, common surgeries. Putting these people in a storehouse and literally having people bid on the organs for sale. <laughs> and it seems uh, 3D printing may move us away from that, but then you kind of get curious, well, okay, let's take a look at, you know, this novel you're talking about here, uh, <laughs> and the Sundos and the idea of modifying DNA. Where would it be when they decide, well, we're going to go ahead and modify this a little bit for this person, you know, without them being aware of it? Boy, it really borders on super science fiction, doesn't it? Yes. Well, certainly those things are, are possible, feasible, um, but uh, they're not really in my book. Uh, my book is more uh, world government by the 30th century, and um, when the Sindos get control of it, uh, they uh, have a problem, or many of them have a problem with intermarriage now that uh, they're in the majority, they're starting to see intermarriage between humans, and some of them don't like it. So it is kind of like racial purity, they, they think, and, and, and for this reason, they want to uh, get rid of the, the humans. But um, the, uh, the, uh, the, I talked about the secret society. They are a nonviolent society, so they do things by demonstrations, uh, economic boycotts, uh, peaceful means, kind of follow along Mahatma uh, Gandhi's basic uh, principles. You try to make changes, in other words, get human, get equal rights for humans, get everything back to normal, but you do it by nonviolent methods. So it's a very difficult to do that in an environment where this um, new race of 
uh, humanoids is trying to exterminate you. Uh, they have one weapon, and that's they have their brain power, and they use that, and um, it takes them some time, but their true hero, unfortunately, he gets killed off, but uh, uh, Zex Den Ho uh, invents, he's, he's a Nobel laureate, but he invents time machine, but he keeps it a secret, for, except from other people in his society, in the secret society. And that's one of the reasons why they have a secret society, is to try to bring things back to normal because they realize there was a defect in the uh, Sindos, um, mainly because at the time they didn't envision them living on Earth. They only envisioned them going away to other solar systems. So the uh, engineers who did that uh, genetic engineering, the one who headed it was Jennifer's grandpa. And in this period of time, people, average lifespan is 800 years. That's up wow. 10 times from what it is today. Uh, and that's not unreasonable uh, with all the technology, the genetic engineering, and uh, what we've learned just in the past 10 years is amazing. Uh, there's a material called NAD, and um, it's a complex molecule, but if you have more of it, you age slower. They were able to take rats and rats that were old and they injected them this material, and then they started behaving like they're young, and their fur got better, and their eyes, eyesight got better. And So um, these types of things are here today almost, uh, they're not, they're not FDA approved yet, but I would say within 20 years, uh, they should be in, in the drugstore. You know, uh, that's really intriguing that you bring that up, uh, Dr. Levin, if I may, from this point forward, so people can realize we're dealing with somebody who really knows what he's talking about here, <laughs> and not just a novelist who goes out and does research, but... When you talk about slowing life down, I find that intriguing because I remember probably some 20 years ago as I was studying in the Eastern philosophies, uh, the idea of Tai Chi, for instance, right. is that the Chinese had a philosophy or an idea that all human life, when born into this world, you know, let's say putting fate and things like that aside, that we all pretty much equally have the same amount of time. So in other words, they're probably saying in, in their own way, biologically, the human body should be able to exist for this much time. They looked at it saying, okay, let's just say, for instance, that the average biological human body lifespan is 125 years. It was through, let's say, the practice of Tai Chi, and that could just be one of many practices they were talking about. But they were saying the same thing. It wasn't so much that you extend life in as much as you slow it down so you have that extension. You know, rather than it moving at its own pace, you're slowing it down so instead of 125 years, maybe it's 150, 100, 200 years, whatever, because you've slowed that process right. of biological ge degeneration down. That's kind of what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And the... Um there's also, you know, new organs. We talked about the printing before. Uh, there's also, um, the, when they built the Sindos, they learned how to uh, increase uh, life longer, uh, and they applied some of that. So there were a few, in other words, if you go to the 30th century natural, they call them naturals and humans, they are still different than what we are today because they have been engineered. They have been, uh, for, for certain things, but they wanted to preserve their natural DNA, but they did uh, extend their life. Of course, they had done that already over the centuries before that. But, uh, and, you know, I, I think if there is probably somebody today, probably female, born, you know, they will probably live to be 150 years old. There is probably somebody because of all the knowledge and in, in, in increases in medicine. And, and things of that nature. Uh, and so I, I, I expect, you know, gradually we will increase. Right now the average is 80. And uh, look how we've been able to do in the last 100 years. Right. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, especially in a noisy, heavily polluted, unnaturally polluted, and I don't mean just smoke, but just all the way around noise, you know, just 
<laughs> advertising, exactly. all of it. It's just, you know, you, you will kind of wonder people, I've even touched on this many times over the years, attention deficit disorder, perhaps the increase in autism comes from a biological way that we're shutting all that noise down. It's our adaptability to it. <laughs> yeah. So. Yes. Now, Jennifer, uh, getting back to the novel here, because I remember we were talking quite a bit about this last time you were on the program, and, and in bringing this element of your book up, it's it's pretty uh, 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 wonderful to note that, uh, for instance, you uh, helped found a, a company which focused on oceanic, uh, airplane oceanography, remote sensing, flying into hurricanes, sensor products that were used for research in anti-submarine warfare, uh, you know, things like this. And when you think about sensors, and for instance, the idea of going into space and black holes, because we were talking about this, I remember, uh, on the last program. And this is where Jennifer kind of introduces some new concepts in physics for her PhD and the idea of the acceleration of the universe. For instance, the idea that black holes actually make space and it's in this space that leads to the universe's expansion at an accelerating rate. And I always thought about that myself in regards to also the Big Bang Theory, and then I remember we were talking about last time Stephen Hawking, how he says, you know, the black hole compresses everything that goes into it, and then it explodes at least. And that was a thought that I had as a kid. Let's talk about that whole idea here. First of all, the Big Bang Theory and you know, because that's always an ongoing. Is it creationism by one God, or did it just blow up and start, or has it been doing that for God knows? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. No, we don't. there's a lot of things we don't know. There's more things we don't know than we do know. But in Jennifer's theory, I call, I call it J-theory, um, the, yes, the black holes make space. And in her theory, there's a cyclic universe, and that means that the Big Bang is just one bang, and we will have another bang. And the, the universe goes through some sort of cycle. And this, uh, there's, there's a theory out that Roger Penrose uh, called it the uh, conformal cyclic cosmology. And what it means is there's no start and there's no end, and it continues forever. And in, uh, if you go into J-theory, J and, and by the way, that was Einstein's theory uh, originally until the Big Bang Theory came along. Uh, he, he'd like this to become more of a static universe where there was no beginning and no end. Um, and, uh, but uh, in, in, uh, in, in Jay theory or Jennifer's theory that she gets for her PhD, uh, the universe will be, uh, well, I, first I have to tell you about a couple of mysteries, but uh, and that is, Nobody knows how black holes get so big that they're at the center of every galaxy, and they're, some of them are a billion times more massive than our sun. And the way that's they grow a pretty by big no size when you think yeah. about it—a billion times it, bigger than our own sun. Wow. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Particularly, uh, Andromeda is not no by no means the biggest. The question is, um, in Jennifer's theory, when they get to a certain size, they get so big they will turn into a white hole, and that is a big bang. So the way you get another big bang is in, in, in evolution of the universe, it first expands, and then it starts to contract again. And then you get mergers of these black holes, especially where we have there's some parts of the universe that are bound uh, gravitationally. And, uh, and, and there may be a hundred galaxies or more in, in typical uh, areas like this. Well, if all these black holes combine together, eventually they'll come to a size. And by the way, all your stars have burned out by now, and it'd be very difficult for humans to exist in this universe. But remember, we are talking that there are multiverses, and we don't know how many of them there are, but there are many, uh, according to string theory and other um, quantum, uh, other forms of the theory of everything. String theory is just kind of the, the, the theory of everything. There are other theories that deal with these things, like uh, I guess one of the leading ones is uh, uh, what's called loop. You know, you got strings, you got loops, they're not a big difference, but loop 
gravitational theory is merging the theory of relativity with quantum mechanics. So, um, and and it does a pretty good job. But uh, J theory is also dealing with uh, those those strange issues. So, uh, but anyway, Jennifer's theory is that the Big Bang was caused by a black hole turning into a white hole. So every, maybe you get multi, multiple universes because that happens in one universe. You get, if the, depending on the size of the black hole, that we don't know because we haven't done the physics yet or we don't have the, uh, the equation to calculate it yet. But, you know, working on it, maybe someday we'll be able to calculate that. But the most fundamental difference is that in J theory, mass, energy, and uh, space are all related by one equation. They're all fundamentally the same thing in different form. They can be transmuted from one to the other. So, you know, we, we know that they're virtual particles. The virtual particles are like a positron and an electron come into existence. Do they come from nothing or do they come from space, which is something? which is transmuted from energy or mass or both. Um, and, and by the way, if those positron and electron combine, they form 100% pure energy because a positron is antimatter for an electron. And you have the same for a proton. You have antiprotons, antimuons, and all of these things. Every particle has an antiparticle pretty much. Um, and that uh, makes a very big fundamental difference between the two theories because they're all based, everything is based on a certain set of hypotheses. Uh, like quantum mechanics has them, and uh, quantum mechanics has, has been more pretty much proven uh, today. Um, nothing's ever proven 100%. You now, just, just something. Uh, let's go ahead and touch on that just real briefly, Dr. Levin, about quantum yeah. mechanics for our listeners who may be familiar with the term and maybe even somewhat familiar with what it is. If you could just on a basic, you know, yeah. kind of grasp level size, what is quantum mechanics? Okay, let's use an example. We'll start with an atom, okay? Uh, it's kind of like we thought of an atom, and it has electrons, and they're in orbit. And they can go to another orbit, but they can't go in between. They can be this way, or they can be that way. There are only certain orbits they can jump into. So one is, has a certain energy, and if you go up, jump it up to the next energy, the when it goes down, it will radiate a certain wavelength. And that's how we identify most atoms, by these wavelengths that, that jump. That's called spectroscopy. So the, the, the fact that there are different energy levels, and this is important in space because uh, with Einstein's theory, uh, it can't get into trouble because you got to infinity, infinitely dense, because in, we can't do that in quantum mechanics because it can only go to the Planck's constant at a certain distance. It can't, can't get any smaller than that. Space is quantized, but it can't get any smaller than a certain amount. Okay, so it can't become infinitely dense. It can't go smaller than that. And so that kind of really uh, fixes uh, uh, the, um, uh, the errors in uh, relativity. Uh, and that's, um, so it, in, in the quantum mechanics, if you have like the hydrogen atom, you, there's certain equations called uh, the uh, uh, Schrodinger equation. Schrodinger was, one of the people who founded quantum mechanics, along with Dirac, the two of them shared the Nobel Prize for founding quantum mechanics. And we also shared a fun story about the Schrodinger experiment, which was his cat. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> the last time. We'll let people listen to that show. That's another time. But <laughs> yeah. that, that, when I first read that, I was like, wow. You know, my mind just <laughs> exploded with that one. But anyway. Yeah, there's, he's, 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 these are all thought experiments. That just call do. that the cat theory. <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting, yeah. So, uh, but there are probabilities, and, and that's one of the interesting things. You don't have an exact position of an electron. That leads to the uncertainty principle, which Schrodinger and I, you know, accepted, but uh, Heisenberg was the, the one who did that. He was also in charge of the 
German nuclear bomb program, and I'm, he, he really uh, advised uh, Hitler that it would be the war would be over before they would could build a nuclear weapon. Even though they continued to work on it, uh, they were planning to build one using heavy water, which is uh, deuterium oxide, which means that the hydrogen, normal hydrogen has one proton, and uh, deuterium has two protons. And if you make water with that, uh, two protons, uh, you can uh, get a nuclear reaction with uh, uranium, uh, and you can trans muted into, in a reactor, you can transmute it into plutonium, which is ideal for making nuclear weapons. So, um, you know, they, they were working that method, and India and Canada both use that method for their nuclear reactors, and I'm sure India used it for making their nuclear bomb, and um, I, I imagine Pakistan may have done the same thing, but I don't know for sure. Um, but anyway, those are some interesting tidbits that uh, come out of um, uh, history and policy and, and uh, other things. But it, it is very interesting that you had these great people who were great scientists, and they ended up nearly killing everybody, to, you know, each other, uh, probably as well, um, developing nuclear weapons. And... Uh, the guy who did it was Oppenheimer, and he was a close friend of Dirac's. And Oppenheimer founded the Center for Theoretical Studies, and he brought Russians over uh, to visit and to talk because he wanted to, you know, not get people blowing each other up. He was trying to do. And he felt very guilty about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and uh, unfortunately, he got cancer and he died. But he lost his security clearance because he was trying to do better relations between nations and, uh, you know, was trying to get communications between various scientists and so that they wouldn't blow each other up. Uh, well, and that's funny that you way. should bring that up, too, because that's right up there with Jerry Lewis being kicked off the Jerry Lewis telethon <laughs> because <Yeah>. he <laughs> discovered there was actually a cure for what all this fundraising was for. And they said, but we don't want one. We just want to keep raising money. You don't get that, you're done. <laughs> I was like, okay. But I thought this was the purpose for raising the money when you think about it yeah. anyway. Yeah, well, my God, I hope we can get a cure uh, for every disease. And in the 30th century, in my book, we have a cure for every disease. Uh, and uh, so we basically, they, they, they live it. doesn't mean people can't get something sick, but they have a, they have a cure for it. And, uh, you know, they might have to replace an organ. They might have to do something different times. But um, essentially, disease is un under complete control. And you don't have to die, die of disease. And that's why we have extended life. Um, you know, today we have many types of diseases. Uh, we have many that have been cured, like many infectious diseases have been cured, but some haven't. Uh, many virus diseases are still not curable. And pro there, there's something called a prion. Uh, for not like mad cow disease, and recently Stanley Blucher, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, finding out that mad cow disease was caused by prion, he now thinks that all our major diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, and they've actually identified a prion for Parkinson's disease and, and several other uh, neurological diseases, I believe, Huntington, et cetera. So the, these are molecules. Uh, that are relatively small compared to biological, like viruses. By, by our definition of life, viruses are not alive because they need something else. To, they're, uh, to, to, um, they need to take over somebody's uh, uh, DNA in order to reproduce themselves. But they can, they, see, viruses were very smart. They could actually modify a DNA to, instead of making its own self make a virus. Right. Yeah, you so. see, now you're touching on something, and it's funny because as we've been talking here about your uh, book, uh, 30th Century, and, you know, we were talking about the Sundos earlier and how they were, you know, their DNA was modified and, and, and the challenges that were faced there. Then we've been talking about, of course, 3D printing. 
is when we go back to the Big Bang Theory, we're mostly talking, for most people, would think about rock, space, dust, <laughs> you know, things yeah. like that. We never really talk about, you know, the biology element of it, such as bacteria, which is pretty much perceived to be where life begins forming in unique ways, plants, yeah. animals, and the like. Now, I kind of wanted, because you're right on it here with this idea of how viruses actually become intelligent enough to create themselves, the idea of bacteria being able to do that, this intelligent being, this life form that usually is the starting point of pretty much all life as far as I know, yes. and I know uh, certainly you've got a degree in chemistry, a, a bachelor's of science for crying out loud, so correct me if I'm wrong, but here was a funny thing. I was interviewing a guy some years back, and he was out of Portland, Oregon. He had a simple series of small, quick-to-read books called Kitchen Sink Farming. And one of the biggest things, all of his books pretty much start the same way. But he talks specifically about bacteria. And here's this guy talking about kitchen sink farming, how to grow all the food you'll ever need within your own house. You won't need yeah. any. You'll even have enough to give to other people, for instance. But he talks about the intelligence of bacteria. And it was so refreshing, and coming from a book like that, you think, wow, who is this guy? But this was a guy that just decided to study a lot of this stuff on his own. But you don't hear a lot about that in the creation, for instance, of the universe, you know, beyond the Big Bang. It's just, okay, well, here's the planets, and here's the idea of the universe, but what about the rest of it? How yeah, science well, disciplines is... come together and say, okay, let's see if we can all figure this out. Does that ever happen? Not very often, because uh, I, sometimes I've seen, by, at, at the University of Miami when I was there in the 19, uh, early 1970s, I, I got my PhD in 71, and then I founded that company. But um, actually, I founded a company before I actually got my gra graduated, uh, you know, but just a few weeks before. Um, but anyway, the, uh, let me to try to answer your question about, uh, you know, uh, not only do you, we have people who do string theory. We have people who do quantum loop theory. And they go to their conferences, and they don't go to the other conferences. And there are very few. There is one, uh, the, the, the Physics, American uh, Physical Society. There is, a, there is a conference where they all, all come together. But they attend these meetings, and the other ones attend those meetings, and they're scheduled at the same time. You can't attend both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because I want to attend both. Sounds like an insurance company. <laughs> yeah, All the departments the are other. kept apart from each other. They're kept at yeah. war with each other. So the end result is the client doesn't get the service they were paying for. <laughs> yeah. But uh, every once in a while, you mm. will get a conference, a specific conference, that will invite people from other areas together. It doesn't happen very often, but it it takes one individual to do it, you know. Right. Anybody can start a conference and you could give a new title, and uh, you have to you have to you have to be a PR person to get one started. You have to do a lot of PR. But and intriguing enough, I will say, I think it was back in 2000 when I was still uh, broadcasting out of Portland, Oregon. They actually brought together a conference that was over the course of seven days, I think, that was just that way. So I was bringing in different guests from different disciplines. You know, it could be astrophysics, yep. and then one was anthropology. And it was really fascinating to walk away from those interviews and see that there was a collaboration of the scientific disciplines to just kind of basically pinpoint, what is this all about, you know? Yeah. Well, I think there is good collaboration between uh, – Archaeologists and anthropologists, that's very good. They do, they do collaborate. But every, once in a while, you'll have a conference where there'll be biologists. They're trying to understand the theory of life. And, you know, people, they start these experiments. They're mainly chemists. They put things in a tube. They put electricity in there. They put light in there. They put all types of things. And they form compounds. And they're trying to simulate what happened in the oceans many years ago. Uh, and there are other people who, you know, are fundamental physicists, they, they invite them to come to help try to understand what was, and they, and they have, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, to, to what, what, uh, what was the earth like back in the early time? 
and uh, you know they're geophysicists. And Dirac's daughter is one at uh, uh, Scripps, Monica Parker. She married another great uh, oceanographer named Bob Parker. Actually, Robert Parker, I should call him. Uh, but um, it is a uh, um, an amazing thing. It's places like Scripps and the University of Miami's Oceanographic School. It used to be the Institute of Marine Science, but now it's the Rosenstiel School for Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Things change. Uh, but those guys, because they have a particular application where they want to help, the, the oceanographers will sometimes, and the geophysicists will get together and, and work on these problems of what was the Earth like way back 4 billion years ago while well, it was hotter than hell. Uh, but when you get, uh, you know, um, maybe three billion years ago, and uh, three and a half, 3.8, I think they call 3.9, between 3.8 and 3.9, is where they think some form of life started, and that form of life was a very simple bacteria. But later on, it learned how it, 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 uh, what do you say, Um, uh, was modified to a kind of cyanobacteria, which... uh, produced oxygen. So that was the first photosynthesis. And before that, the Earth had no oxygen. So uh, these things spread throughout the ocean and made oxygen. And now we have plankton, uh, and uh, which are uh, uh, you know, uh, operate on photosynthesis. They're kind of, uh, there's some algae that do it, and, and, and these cyanobacteria and other things. You know, Things in freshwater ponds and in salt water that, uh, that that produce oxygen. But without that oxygen, the world would be a very different place today. And uh, you know, you wouldn't have uh, organisms like humans and dogs and cats and um, uh, even mice. Uh, almost all insects breathe oxygen. Now, there are life forms that don't need oxygen. They live deep in the ocean. But most fish, they have to breathe oxygen. So you, you didn't get much life. You got some very simple forms of life, but not much life in the sea. Down in the deep vents, uh, they can run off of chemotherapy. They don't need the sunlight. They don't need other things. Uh, and, and, and life probably started there. But uh, this is, you know, after you got all these scientists together, and they looked at the things and this. They were trying to, they, the object was, how is life formed? And, you know, we, many years ago, uh, the University of San Diego, uh, University of California at San Diego, uh, it's really in La Jolla. Well, La Jolla is now part of San Diego, so that's okay. But uh, in those days, it wasn't when it was first formed. It was a separate town. But uh, interesting enough that uh, the way things evolve, uh, San Diego was a leader, and uh, Yuri was an example of one of the first people he, he, who he found out, you know, he talked about deuterium in the oceans, but he really spent most of his time trying to figure out well, how did life evolve in the oceans. And uh, there's a building named after him, and <laughs> I, I used to go up there to Yuri Hall. And it, it's, it's a very great place, but the new buildings are just fantastic by comparison. And uh, thanks to uh, Erwin Jacobs for donating so much money to the university, the engineering center is just amazing. Uh, When I first came here in 1982, uh, the university was small by comparison. It has grown so much. A lot of private donations and a lot of state money. But it's just an amazing school now, and we should all be very proud of that. uh, organization um, because they've done a lot of good, but there have been a lot of great scientists. So if you can get people like uh, uh, Yuri to try to get all other scientists to look at what he's doing and what other people are doing and try to come up with better ways to uh, try to simulate uh, these conditions. And, uh, you know, we can't wait millions of years uh, so we try to accelerate it, find ways to accelerate. But people do this on a computer. 
And it's very easy to accelerate a computer from a few minutes to a few million years. So, uh, you know, computer modeling has become very useful in these sciences. Um, and I think um, in, in the future, we'll have artificial intelligence that will will assist us. And I know uh, tr the, uh, um, uh, what's his name, uh, our gov former governor um, who got divorced recently, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, yeah, he uh, played in a, something called Terminator, where the artificial intelligence was, you know, uh, very bad. And uh, I think that was kind of a warning. But in my book, the AIs are, well, particularly one, but the, uh, the, mo the most powerful and intelligent uh, AI is the, is the, becomes the good guy. Which the Schwarzenegger character eventually did become. <laughs> well, he did, but uh, it, 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 the, the AI behind him that created him right. was the evil one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the major computer that, that uh, was the, what was it called? Uh, Cyberdyne, I believe it was, Cyberdyne Systems. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and see, that was the whole idea, but, you know, and when you take a look at that Terminator idea is the idea that, so the machines took over, in other words, the machines somehow felt threatened, in other words, they it's like they came to know Sky. the yeah. definition Skynet. of death, and yeah. said humans are going to, you know, they were thinking humans are going to cause this, so they rapidly became, you know, a force that definitely was to be reckoned with, you know, and so it's funny when people think, for instance, about creating machines, well, this is just a machine, but in time you have to think, well, the person that created the machine, somehow intrinsically there is a part of their energy, their personality in this machine, and to give you an idea that I think machines, interestingly enough, have a very intuitive way about them and I remember years ago I was watching a documentary on the Titanic and they had then where they have they were starting to explore with the small remote control submarines you know so they were able to take these submarines without anybody in them and the guy could be sitting safely and remote control this but they were still attached to wires and they were showing, and it was funny to watch us, how the machine, as it was getting ready to go into the Titanic, felt timid about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't the operator. It was actually the machine like, damn, I don't know if I want to go down there, man. It's awfully dark. <laughs> but that people don't think about, you know, it's just a machine, but it was created with energy. And there's that possibility that there, and it's just a, a silly way of looking at it, but I think it's a, a strong one. That energetically, that it has its own little bit of intuition. Yeah, well, it can a machine can become sentient, and uh, I think the true artificial intelligence it will become sentient, and I think that's the big thing. Will it be good or will it be bad when it becomes sentient? Will it want to kill us or will it want to protect us? Uh, so, in uh, in my book. The machine is the good guy. So essentially, artificial intelligence is a machine. It's a non-biological and uh, a living machine. And uh, this is, you know, been treated in ma many other books. I'm not the first to do it, but in most books, it's bad that I've read. But I think that I think opposite. I think they they, they won't have emotion. They won't react uh, without reason and. Uh, they will tend to think through all the options, and I think, you know, a machine can be um, the uh, the good guy uh, right. because we 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 tend to react when we're attacked. We tend to react, and we usually react violently. And that's just human nature. At least if we study history, and I'm not very good at history, but uh, I, I, you know, I had a one of my wives was very good at history. Uh, she unfortunately died from breast cancer, but uh, uh, I, I'm remarried now. Um, but anyway, um, it's uh, uh, interesting that you know we we can learn a lot from history, but we we see almost always there is violence to resolve problems that come up, and usually those problems come up because 
somebody gets greedy and wants to take their neighbor's territory or they think the neighbor took their territory and they want it back. Like right now we have a problem in uh, the uh, Russia and the uh, Crimea. Uh, they took it from the Ukraine. And, um, you know, someday there, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of violence, but they took it by force. If Ukraine tries to take it back, they'll start a war. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the way humans work. We, we, the, the, the Ukrainians. It's our reptilian area of our brain, I believe. Animals. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. Territorial. Yeah. But, you know, that's the evolution of the prefrontal cortex and the idea of reasoning. And I was going to touch on the idea back to the idea of machinery and artificial intelligence as you were talking about uh, that, you know, that typically they're showcased as being bad. And I remember uh, going back to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey yep. and, of course, yeah, the computer HAL. You know, yep. there he was with great intentions. And I thought what was fascinating is I didn't see there was the, the uh, sequel, which was 2010. And that's the one that stars Roy Scheider, where they actually go back to that craft and psychologically try to figure out where did Hal go off the deep end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I like, I, I love uh, Stanley, and uh, yeah. uh, but the, I think, yeah, the. Finding out what the a psychological problem that that, mm. that occurred, where did it go mad? Yeah, you're right. That, you know, that, he was in that, space just like the guys were. Which I wanted to get back to what we were uh, starting to talk to when I was t uh, talking or sharing with the listeners about your creation, for instance, of remote sensing and 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 so forth, and back to the black holes. And we only have about six minutes of this, and hopefully we'll we'll take a look at doing another show and really explore this further because I think it would really be a lot of fun, especially since we're talking about you know, uh, artificial intelligence, do machines think, you know, and, and how do they process their experiences, you know, especially as we're kind of wrapping it up with HAL and 2001 yeah. A Space Odyssey. But the idea of exploring into a black hole, you know, and the idea mm -hmm. of, of sensor creation and what that would be like, A, proving do they exist, and what in the heck is in them and where do they go? Well, I think gravity waves that we recently have proved that we have black holes and they exist. Uh, also, we recently found these black holes in all the in, in the center of galaxies, and because their gravitational uh, is necessary, that the the nearby stars spin at a very rapid rate. Um, at least according to Einstein, there are certain things about a black hole and a white hole. A black hole, things that get close will be inside. Uh, will be pulled inside. The, there's an event horizon. That means if you get closer than this point called the event horizon, you, you, you're going to be sucked in. And that's the problem. And what's inside there, nobody knows. But if you get inside there, you most probably are going to be dead long before you get inside because the gravitational force is so strong, it would tend to spaghetti, make you into a long piece of spaghetti. I don't believe we could live in that form. Um, so you would be crushed and stretched by the gravitational forces before you ever got inside. But assume you could get inside, or you could put some robot inside, or uh, something inside that had sensors. You couldn't send any information back. I Once kind of figured inside. that would be one. If flight can't get out of it, I'm sure yeah, <laughs> communication is going to have out. a tough time. You yeah. can't get out, but you can't even get light out. Right? So you can't Unless a Japanese light. transistor radio proves effective. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you can't get the you can't get the radio waves out either. Uh, so it's all electromagnetic radiation, and, it, and you can't, it won't escape. So that's the problem. Uh, but space can get out if if indeed it does make space. It's, it's only a theory. Uh, then the space gets out. But space, you know, Einstein said that space was a, fa was a fabric. Space-time is a fabric, right? And that it can be um, distorted. And, you know, of course, and that would be where gravity waves come in. And if you had two collide, collide and we've just proven, we've had, we've had uh, five different collisions, uh, 
Four of them have been black hole collisions that we have since it's operating in, in uh, it was September 2015, started operating the LIGO that per, per, can, can uh, detect these gravity waves. There were uh, four were black hole collisions, and one was a neutron star collision. In my third book, and well, actually, even my, my second and third book are a lot about uh, this neutron star collision that is, if not, if not stopped, it, it will destroy the Earth in the 57th century. Wow. So we go way into the future, and um, uh, because I think you need that kind of technology in order to uh, be able to take on those kind of challenges. In other words, there's certain, there, uh, you know, when you come to some of the real kind of futurists like uh, me, uh, Michi, uh, Michio Kaku, and uh, uh, other um, futurists, um, they look at societies as reach, we haven't reached level one yet. Uh, but uh, what, what, what can level one do? And eventually you get into these levels that will, they will build a, a, a energy conversion device to, to take solar energy from the sun because these societies that will want to do great things, they're going to need tremendous amounts of energy. In that, in, in uh, what do they call that now? Uh, where the whole sun, the whole solar system, there's a, a sphere built around it in order to capture all this solar energy. Yeah, I remember uh, we had someone who worked with NASA, and he actually produced a book that was fictional, sort of non-fictional fiction uh, work where. He was showing actually where I guess the Japanese would build something like that around the Earth, you know, sort of like a big ring that would just basically. But then the question comes: Who then controls the energy? <laughs> now well, we on our that problem. yeah, we oil, so oil we wars have been fought over that. Yeah, of course, uh, and we're going to need the energy to fight the wars. But uh, we're just about out of time here. But first of all, I kind of wanted to tease our audience for the next time that you're on the show because we're talking about these sort of things like black holes. And I know that now there is what's known as the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. We'll just call that LIGO for short because that's hard to say even one time fast, let alone five. And this here actually talks or searches for distortions in space-time and things like that. So that's interesting enough, and then we'll explore more about uh, your uh, books uh, in this series here, which are talking a lot about this stuff that seems very real and just right there on the event horizon, if you will. How could people find out more about how to get your books, things like that? Well, Amazon is a good place, 30th Century Escape, and I have a website, which will also direct you to Amazon, um, but uh, it's called 30thCentury.org, 30thCentury.org, and that's the website, and uh, it will uh, direct you to it, the, uh, you know, where you can get the book, but it will also tell you what's in the book. You can read the first three chapters for free on the website, so you can get started and decide whether you really want to read the book. You, get a, you can get a taste of it. And you can also see lots of pictures about the characters in the book. And because any book is really not about science. It may have a lot of science in it, but it's about the characters and how they develop and how they, you know, uh, struggle. Uh, one of my favorite uh, Greek mythologies was, when I was a child, was Hercules. And, uh, of course, he was half God and half man. But he managed to do all the chores that the gods required him to do. And I thought that was really funny, cleaning out the staples and, and uh, all of those other things he had to do. Some of them were kind of silly, but, you know, uh, he did have to fight, face the, what was it, Medusa, that uh, you cut off one head and two more grow. Right. Yeah, and so that's the, that was the, probably the hardest what he had to do. But, so the uh, book is, all, yeah. So the series for the listeners out there is 30th Century, and our guest joining us today, Dr. Mark Kingston Levin, and his website is 30thcentury.org, where you can find out more about the books, the author, and anything else you want to know to get you started on your quest 
want to thank you so much for being on the program today. Thank you. I want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. Be sure to discover more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter so you can stay up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. 